Thank you. Happy 2023. We're going to get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming for tonight's event. We're very excited to have Raquel Gutierrez as our special guest tonight. My name is Tanya Sheraldi Galvez, and I'm a first year PhD, PhD fiction fellow at Black Mountain Institute. I was born and raised in Linwood by, I was raised by a Salvadoran mother and grew up a few miles away from Raquel's Huntington Park. So as a child of immigrants writing from the diaspora, the LA Salvadoran type, witnessing an artist write truthfully and fiercely from a liminal space is so aspirational. So it's an honor to introduce Raquel tonight. On behalf of Black Mountain Institute, the Rogers Foundation, and the College of Liberal Arts, we would like to thank the Barrick Museum for hosting this event tonight. Please take the time to, uh, to please take this moment to silence your cell phones. After the reading, Raquel will take a few questions from the audience. They'll also be available signed copies of their books at the back of the room. The Writer's Block Las Vegas Independent Store is also selling copies of their book, so please do pick up one for yourself. Tomorrow, BMI will also be hosting Stretch Marks, a reading with Jean Munson at 6.30 p.m. in RLL 101, so make sure to check that out. With you, we would first like to acknowledge that UNLV operates from the city of Las Vegas, traditional homeland and unceded territory of the Nuwuvi or the Moapa Band of Paiute people. We encourage everyone in this space to engage in the shared stewardship of the land, in active learning about historical realities of colonialism, and the indigenous people who continue to work and live on this land since time immemorial. Raquel Gutierrez is an arts critic, writer, poet, and educator. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Gutierrez credits the queer and feminist DIY post-punk sign culture of the 1990s plus Los Angeles County and Getty paid arts internship with introducing them to the various vibrant art and music scenes and communities throughout Southern California. Gutierrez is a 2021 recipient of the Rapkin Prize in Arts Journalism, as well as a 2017 recipient of the Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. Their writing has appeared in Art in America, NPR Music, Places Journal, and High Country News. Gutierrez teaches in the Oregon State University Cascades Low Residency Creative Writing MFA program. When I read their essay collection, Brown Neon, I was stuck by the unflinching and powerful language. Part butch, memoir, part ekphrastic tra travel diary, part queer family tree, Raquel's debut essay collection forces the, real, the reader to interrogate one's positionality in the literal and fi figurative landscapes of our time and space. Written between 2015 and 2019, these works demand the reader to look at the hard stuff as an artist, a reader, a writer, with the backdrop of systemic oppression of queer, Latinx, and migrant people. From witnessing border wall prototypes in Tijuana, mourning the loss of chosen family, contending with class and gender while negotiating Latinx identity, Raquel writes sin pelos en la lengua, without mincing their words. We're taken from Blythe to LA, HP, San Francisco, San Antonio, Tijuana, Tucson, on this quest to understand art, self, identity, and love. Throughout their work, Raquel poses questions with no easy answers. With such nuance, they seize you. They ask, what does it mean to exist structural conditions that erode those desires for peace and happiness? How does the wealth gap determine one's ability to survive economic and natural catastrophes? On reckoning Latinx artist identity, they ask, is this what moving beyond survival looks like? These questions seize me, and I hope they seize you too. Now, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Raquel Gutierrez. All right, thank you, Tanya. That was so beautiful and such a warm um, welcome to Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, I, uh, yeah, you know, um, I have an aunt and a few cousins and uh, an uncle in Henderson here, but I didn't reach out just because family. Um, and uh, but I, I must return. I must return because. The, the, the guilt is just like seizing my heart. And so, but also it's so amazing to be here and just to be in this space, this gorgeous museum. 
and all the conversations I've had thus far with uh, members of the um, of the MFA uh, and uh, Black Mountain Institute, um, and uh, finally meeting Colette, uh, who has been a, a champion of my work um, since uh, since I, before I had an MFA. So. Um, I know there's a Mike Jones um, quote there that I need to summon, but I'll, it'll come to me later. I was gonna read one piece, but then, um, you know, sometimes when, when I'm at a loss, I always just start at the beginning. So I'm gonna read from my first essay in Brown Neon called On Making Butch Family in Intertextual Dialogue. And the intertextual dialogue is um, between this essay and the last essay that my um, a friend and mentor, the late Jean Cordova, had written and had didn't have it published, but gave it to me to get it out into the world on some level. And I did so through um, my weird little performance studies training, um, just to inter interweave it with, uh, with this essay. So I will be reading it in the voice that I used when I played her um, in her, um, uh, performance. Uh, it was like instead of a book party, we staged the scenes from her memoir uh, um, when we were outlaws. So I'll be using that voice um, and, and you'll know. Okay. 2015. The battery light shines red on my dashboard, a warning jolting me out of an obsessive sing-along. I am alone in my car again, repeating the hook of lovin', touchin', squeezin'. As a way to offset the numbness that comes with the unremarkable parts of a road trip in progress. On the highway, I'm just another heavy heart lifted by song, imagining loved ones shrinking in the distance with each stolen glance at the rearview mirror. My reptilian brain is low on dopamine again. It wants its queer family. It wants to hit Steve Perry high notes next time it does karaoke. It wants to be on to the next occasion. The possibility of my car breaking down and preventing me from orchestrating the next occasion sends a chill. My car has never broken down before and certainly not in the big, bad, scary desert. I travel west on the 10, heading back to Los Angeles, trudging through 100 degrees of Arizona's unsparing desert heat. As soon as I touch down in Quartzsite, one of the last towns near the state line, I go for my car owner's manual. Just how screwed could I possibly be with 300 miles still to go? The electrical system is on the verge of shutting down. I decide that if I'm going to break down, I want to do it in a blue state. I have more than 20 miles to go before I hit Blythe, California. I get back in my car, take a deep breath, roll down the windows, and head west to Blythe. Blythe is a place I have newly begun to appreciate as the last bastion of chill brown califas. I don't want to be an irredeemably spoiled Californian brat and call bad vibes, but it was 2016 and the wound of SB 1070 was still fresh. The show me your papers law was first a bill that included provisions that gave law enforcement the power to determine anyone's immigration status during any lawful stop. SB 1070 also push for the requirement for all alien non-citizens to carry registration documents. Undocumented people couldn't seek employment. Arguably the worst were the warrantless arrests. Folks could be arrested for just being suspected of being undocumented. If we didn't see the seeds of fascism being planted in this 2010 series of planned violences, then we weren't looking hard enough. How in 2010, could we not know that people we knew or knew of were already being disappeared? This has been the way political structures permeate the sweeping views of Arizona's stunning terrains. State power is always present in the natural environment. But it's not confined solely to Arizona, just as every state in the Union claims a flower as its own. This occurs to me as I pass the Welcome to California sign. I haven't seen the golden poppies that, that adorn the sign, but know they bloom year round. It is the poet's job to make you fall in love with the idea of state flowers. It's promise of a shared identity built around a regional flower that relies more on bee pollination than water. 
Who could be unmoved by such a seduction? I grew up seeing those beguiling orange poppies while making the drive between California's deserts. As a kid, I was taken to see members of my mother's family eking out lives as casino mechanics and shop owners in Las Vegas and Boulder City, Nevada. Or we would take family vacations in Lake Havasu or Bullhead City in Arizona. There were always golden fields ablaze with these funny named flowers. It was the homonym for the name my sister and I used to address our father, Papi, our father. He was our first intrepid navigator through these southwestern desert roads in hardy vehicles, like our plushed out Econoline van, carpeted and upholstered in cobalt blue and replete with antenna television. I see the familiar date palms in the distance. This is how I self-soothe while anticipating the imminent moment of vehicular collapse. I pray that we, my car and I are one, will make it there in one piece. Just as I cross the Arizona California state line checkpoint, I rev the engine and shift it to hit 75 miles per hour before the car begins to shut down on me. Blythe, next four exits. I just needed the first one. The lights on the odometer begin to flash, the digital clock flakes all zeros and the stereo pops through my speakers. It feels a little back to the future and my improvised DeLorean is tearing through the desert's space-time continuum. The first exit finally appears and I coast across lines and make my first California stop since high school in order to peter out in front of a tractor tow lot. I'm good. It's not a miracle by any means, but I made land art with that descent. I call for roadside assistance, check that my phone is charged, and that I still have two big bottles of water to get me through the next couple of hours. A sigh of relief that I've been careful with my recent expenditures, as I have just enough credit limit to pay for whatever damages my car is about to cost. I thank Tucson for being so cheap, and I'm glad my lover and my son are not in my car. Parting was hard. I get out of the car, light a cigarette, and take in my surroundings. I had places to be, but now time splits open for me. I am stuck in my career, in my relationship, and now en route back to the couch I surfed in Los Angeles County when all I wanted was to be in Tucson. But I don't have a community there with couches to choose from. Trucks and tumbleweed and the hum of the interstate a few yards away. The sturdy stuff that can occupy the same space as the desert without totally melting. I'm melting. I used to be sturdy, but now I melt. And between huffs of nicotine smoke and rivulets of sweat forming on the small of my back, I feel myself seesawing between sturdy and molten in the desert heat. The tow truck and technician finally come, and after the last call with the third auto shop, I know there is no way I'm going to Los Angeles anytime soon. The desert isn't ready to let go. This is just the first battle in the video game called Someone in Tucson Hearts Me, named after the threadbare yellow vintage t-shirt I had bought even though it was an extra small. The desert and I have only just begun. In the summer of 2015, a young adopted son, my young adopted son, returned home from San Francisco and threw a party for me. Due to the cancer, I couldn't throw a party, get the beer, barbecue, and girls together. I could only appear, dressed dapperly, walking haltingly around the poolside with my mermaid-headed cane. I wanted to give away to other masculine of center younger women thousands of dollars worth of almost unworn men's shirts and pants. It was butch bonding. Big Papa was a writer. She was on the heels of her memoir when we were outlaws, winning a Lambda Literary Award four years before she died. The section above is from an essay she tried to pen about our relationship, but the cancer in her cerebellum made it hard to finish. I read it from time to time when I start to forget what Big Papa sounded like when I forget what I might have meant to her. Her illness is why I'm so desperate to get back to Los Angeles, to see Big Papa, who is finally starting to receive visitors after an intensely taxing round of chemotherapy. I'm traveling back from Tucson just a few weeks after having moved back to Los Angeles from the Bay Area. 
I had been living out of boxes and tote bags prior to this breakdown in blight. Desire pulled in so many directions, ending relationships, starting relationships, doing art full time. This plus the needful act of performing some kind of discernible adulthood for my parents and their concern for my negative net worth. It was an anarchy of coping with so much change afoot and I had yet to get on Big Papa's calendar. I had last seen her in early July to coordinate and host her Big Butch clothing swap and early birthday party. Big Papa, or Jean, as I had known her before our intimacy, wanted to see the clothes that hung on her now thin frame go to the younger butches in our lesbian Los Angeles world. That meant I was tasked with going into Jean's closets and pulling out custom-made suits, brand name blue jeans, finely tailored shirts with French cuffs, polos and slacks, and creating a temporary clothing post. And I was more than happy to accommodate all of Big Papa's wishes. No whim was too big or small. This was my way of honoring her and doing so in the comfort of her home. Jean and her spouse of 26 years, Lynn, lived in a beautiful Mediterranean-style house in the hills of Los Feliz, a neighborhood near Griffith Park and the Hollywood Studios. Many houses in, that famous, in these famous hills are anything but ordinary. This was the Farrell House, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. in 1926. It was a glorious place that felt like a little bit of Hearst Castle had chipped away and fallen into this corner of Los Angeles. An elegant retreat for Big Papa to hold court, where she could both rest and be as convivial as she was kingly. We had become close five, year, five years earlier in 2010. Our relationship sealed after I played Jean Cordova in a short play Big Papa wrote based on excerpts from When We Were Outlaws. Big Papa had earlier come to know my performance work with the ensemble Uchlali Zapanochtitlan. She and Lynn would come to see our original performance art compositions illustrating different brown butch histories lodged in the lore of the Los Angeles neighborhoods the four of us Buchlalis either grew up in or near or currently lived. The short play Big Papa wrote would become the cornerstone of her Los Angeles book party for when we were outlaws. I love the idea of foregoing a reading and staging a lesbian history on stage. Big Papa enjoyed my portrayal of a youthful, brash, blustering journalist and free-loving seducer she had created with her younger protagonized self, Young Cordova. My performance was received so well that lesbians who came of age politically with Big Papa called me Young Cordova for several years after. The experience pleased Big Papa so much and the love and affection that grew between us was so palpable that like a lover chasing another, she declared to me that she would be my father and I her son. We were a dying breed, she said. Aside from the hard fact that she actually was dying, Big Papa was a dapper butch dandy, someone who fought long and hard to own that identity, only to live out her last days seeing it carted off to the elephant graveyard of queer self-determination. The gender binary was losing its luster as a desirable barometer for queer gender, which meant that Butch was falling in and out of fashion, a complicated monolith awaiting its meteor or sanctuary. Butch was often that category of queer ontology that had to be periodically rescued from the bin of bad punchlines. Queer sociability was slowly pulling the curtain back on what felt like the diminished relationship to an identity Big Papa and I shared. I wanted to age gracefully in the face of perceived disappearance. Big Papa was actually disappearing, though. The butchness between us was ultimately a feeling of recognition that granted us language and confidence despite the generation between us. It was a quotidian inspiration, and not everyone gets that in their daily lives. It's why Big Papa proudly snapped her cufflinks into place every day she had left with us. The elaborations that moved beyond Butch as a category didn't stop me from trying to live each day with similar aplomb either. But it was also the cancer that had viciously followed her for the last decade that made our bond that much more immediate and necessary. My reavowal of a Butch identity felt like re-enlistment. I was following Big Papa into war as her loyal subordinate. There was so much I wanted to know and experience through Big Papa's five senses and I felt the time ticking away from us. I wanted to be who she saw, 
but I was still cautious with Big Papa. Her declaration of butch fatherhood meant a lot to me, but as an adult child of an alcoholic father, I was so used to being disappointed that I didn't want to set my heart on anything with anyone new. Anything by way of love, acceptance, recognition, validation, it was my consciousness that had always been the cornerstone of self-sabotage as far as my relationships went. I struggled to make them last. These tools were the things that my own father could not provide me when I was a child and teenager, and each year the distance between us widened. He, a Mexican immigrant who had a pension for staying out late, philandering and making bad economic decisions that would impact his family. He, a Mexican man who for one reason or another couldn't remember the names of his grandparents whenever I asked them about our family. It wasn't until I learned that my grandmother had birthed her firstborn son out of wedlock that I understood the murky connection to our larger family tree in Mexico. My dad tried to instill a bond the best way he could by talking about the outstanding things of his hometown, Pachuca, whether it was his drunken exaltation of Relo Monumental, the watchtower built to commemorate the Mexican Revolution, or a club de fútbol Pachuca, one of the oldest soccer teams in modern day Mexico, my dad found ways to keep his Mexico alive in a country that tried to cannibalize him. Yet in the space of our home, it was easier for me to adopt more of my mother's Salvadoranness, even though I would travel to Mexico more often free of any fear about what my queer gender might attract in terms of violent attention. My queerness never bothered my Mexican dad. It was the fact that I was born in Los Angeles, had a handful of college degrees, and yet still couldn't muster a net worth he could be proud of. He couldn't make sense out of me and unable to be self-made in the way he had to be out of necessity first, and then out of the will to feed the greed that follows when success is achieved. Me a struggling artist, convener, writer, and what? A professional queer? What is it that I actually do? I was afraid of becoming a known figure in activist Chicanoville because I mostly grew up in white culture with my white Irish mother. I wasn't working class in the age that identified most Latinas as such, afraid I didn't have the street credentials, that I only had a Mexican father to teach me. I devoted myself to Jean. We saw the traces of Mexicanidad in one another in ways that were important to us, that we had the troubled marks upon us thanks to our complicated Mexican fathers who would work themselves to death, not in the fields, but in maintaining the wealth they had won against the odds. Big Papa, my Big Papa. Our relationship meant that I was in charge of inviting the assortment of butches from LA's queer and lesbian communities to Big Papa's swath of paradise. And they came, a young brown butch from Riverside, a professor butch from Echo Park, a handful of older butches from Big Papa's West Hollywood days, a few hipster butches and a couple of artist butches too. They came and tried stuff on, but only about half of the clothing swap attendees went home with a number of items. Big Papa had been fairly robust in size and wheelbarrows full of fine duds were left on the tables and hangers. We both lamented that I wouldn't be able to benefit from her generous offering since I wore a men's medium in shirts and had a 33 inch waist. My ample bosom and big mouth had fooled Big Papa into thinking I was much larger, but I'm actually just petite but portly. We were more than halfway through the afternoon barbecue gathering when Caleb strolled in with a princely bottle of bourbon in hands that resembled little league baseball mitts. He arrived confidently, the only visually pronounced trans guy in the room. His usually unkempt beard was trimmed and his mustache was now shaped handsomely, accentuating the angles in his jawbone and framing his bright white, awkward smile as he came into a party space with all lesbian eyes on him. I wasn't the only one dazzled by how well put together he looked, how comfortable he seemed in his body, leaner, stronger, and anchored in dark denim and a sense of inner calm. People notice that stuff. It's what makes us fall in love. The only trans guy who came was Caleb. He got a whole wardrobe for his first in a family try at graduate school. His valet, the party planner and my son, Raquel. Being a proper Chicano butch, she fussed over him, buttoning unknown buttons, straightening a lapel, tucking in fine shirts. 
I encouraged Caleb to try on a couple of the long sleeve button ups that hung in excess on the makeshift clothing rack I had Jimmy between two branches of a white alder tree in front of the pool house. The first shirt he tried on, a baby blue gingham long sleeve, fit his barrel chest and short thick set arms perfectly. I oohed and ahed every time one of Jean's tailored shirts hugged his body as though they were tailored just for him. What were the chances? Each shirt, the pink Oxford, the navy stripe, the madras checks in monochromatic neutrals, wrapped around his body with ease and elegance. He was no longer the nervous baby Butch Dyke in punk patched denim jackets with cut off sleeves and dilapidated combat boots. He was no longer the homeless baby Butch Dyke kicked out of a religious home, disowned by a homophobic Jehovah's Witness family of cannery workers. He was no longer the baby Butch Dyke living out of a car outside the orchards of Riverside or sleeping in tents following the Occupy movement up to Oakland and back down Interstate 5. He was our young man now. And a part of me felt the pang of losing the feral quality of his iconoclastic youth as I saw Caleb transition into a legible adulthood by way of a respectable wardrobe. His maturation meant I had to double down on my own. But I would be damned if Caleb wasn't the best dressed guy in the graduate program he was due to leave for in a month. I beamed with pride. But in that moment, Big Papa lacked the jubilance I was emanating. She had a cloudy look about her I had trouble reading. Was this a well-worn panic playing out before me, I wondered? Was there a sudden rupture in familiarity? Was this a case of losing butches to unexamined male privilege? I was more anxious about Caleb treading the trouble, troubling waters of class mobility once he left Southern California, but maybe I was alone in that concern. Was I misreading the furrowed brows on the faces of the other butch elders? I was reminded of Sheriel Moraga's reprimand in a 2009 essay called Still Loving in the Still War Years 2009 on keeping queer queer. Moraga polarized queer audiences with her candid take on the fear she had of lesbians abandoning feminism to assume commodified masculine identities as brown trans men. But aren't all of our identities imbricated by the sticky annals of empire and capitalism? How does that identification with accumulation burdened us all to arrive to legibility through wealth and structural platforms. It is these moments that seize me with my own fear. These are the particularities that clarify the ways in which we need each other, how we might midwife for one another the image we form of ourselves. These are the moments that have shown the limits of community, much like the limits of family of origin, in that we are always some reflexive extension of someone else and thus captive to their expectations. And that there's something about these expectations that leave the individual other ontologically exhausted. I tuned out the noise, but not the history that grounded Moraga's sentiment. I was tired of pitting butch dykes against trans men in some imaginary gladiator arena that haunted the dreams of butch elders. Big Papa fought for the right to wear her custom tailored suits in a time that marked the butch as a patsy for patriarchy. Now her queer, queer grandchildren were fighting for the right to transition genders or to do away with the binary altogether. And I was going to hold open the portal that allowed for the old school butch lesbian camaraderie and the new school in gender self-determination to coexist and cross-pollinate. There would be no lesbian activism on the West Coast without Big Papa, who played a huge role as organizer and commentator. She was part of the collective that organized the West Coast Lesbian Feminist Conference, the first ever convergence of its kind in 1973. Even then, in that political and cultural milieu, being a butch lesbian was suspect, and I was well aware of how much Big Papa suffered in keeping that major part of her identity at bay for the comfort of other lesbian kin and comrades who held misgivings about anything remotely butch. Big Papa wasn't the first person to convey how important my butch identity was. I had had enough random bar encounters with a range of queers telling me unprovoked that I was a unicorn, how fleeting and unique I was because all the real butches were transitioning. This was queer culture for a good chunk of the early aughts when butches and femmes began to decouple. Like the dollar to the gold standard, we were finally determining our own currency in the new century. By the time I got to New York for grad school in 2003, everyone around me had not quite had enough with binaries, even as gender was getting another pass through the meaning-making machines of liberal East Coast colleges, or a few years later through social media technologies like Tumblr. We found new ways beyond the bar to connect. 
Our desires for recognition were similar. We started building language together, agreeing to the terms and acknowledging the harms there from there within. But moving from Chicana lesbian Los Angeles to Queer Futures New York meant inhabiting new social circles with tier one queers of color who had graduated to new ontological vocabularies informed by queer theory. I was excited by the coupling of queerness to theory, but I had been a commuter student trying to make each credit count for my journalism major at a state university in the San Fernando Valley of Southern California. I couldn't imagine new forms of desire because butch fan coupling had been my lesbian norm although I would likely would have transitioned myself if I had grown up in an environment that valued mental health and had access to culturally sensitive mental health specialists. But that wasn't available for me. Good health care is hard to come by and I was scared to amass more debt. I also balked at therapy, like a good Generation X. When I got back to Los Angeles in 2005, I paid $5 for sliding scale therapy with a salty Bostonian logging her hours at the Gay and Lesbian Center in Hollywood in an office decorated with Red Sox paraphernalia. Her best advice was to break up with the person I was dating at that time. Throughout my 20s, I had been cautioned to remain queer and resist whatever spoils came with being a warrior for mainstream and binaristic masculinity. In hindsight, it was another battle of identity legibility against ambiguity. Who would nurse me back to health if I got top surgery? I learned to be com comfortable not with my body but with always being at odds with it. The situational incongruence was a price of being queer. In my mind, I have been too plenty, too eager to offer myself. And so of course I was delighted for the attention from Big Papa. Yet I felt the burden of that affirmation and what it meant to respond with assurance to her that this was my path hoping to remain vigilant against casting my own monolithic mold. Maybe the term butch will, like the dinosaurs, become extinct this year. Women who see ourselves as women, yet keep our masculine ways, thoughts, dress, and body language will always be a staple of lesbian life. Like I feel silly on this super hot day sitting here in a sleeveless, er, okay, blouse. That feeling won't change with time, though the term might. And maybe I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you.